male or female, who's scarier? Women like men are just as capable of the unthinkable, and when a bloodthirsty female criminal is incarcerated, they're taken to the worst places. Whether it's extreme torture, heinous slavery, the instigation of riots to cause gruesome murders, or the use of prisoners for fertilizer, these places make death seem like mercy. Brace yourself, for this is how women inmates are treated in jail. The Hidden Torture Chambers of Iran if there's any prison that knows how to torture without lifting a finger, it's the prisons in Iran. Famous for its reputable acts of psychological and emotional torture, the prison is known to leave prisoners with unforgettable and unbearable memories. That's if the prisoners ever leave. One of these prisons is the Evan House of Detention, located in the capital city of Iran, Tehran. As of 2015, Evan Prison was home to 15,000 female inmates. And by home, I mean a torture chamber. Countless ex-prisoners testify that as soon as you enter the walls of Evan Prison, you can put a number on how many times you see the sun. That's because the prisoners are mostly in blindfolds, led around like goats to the slaughterhouse. Most of the inmates in Evan Prison are political prisoners, so the government treats them like their enemies and like their citizens. Their hands are tied with ropes or handcuffs, and they are forced to navigate their way using the stench of vomit and blood. It's either that, or they find their way through the deafening screams from within the halls. The form of torture that the prison is known for is threats of indefinite imprisonment, and this works every time. Because in a place like Evan, the women have no access to food, no water, no access to loved ones, and poor medical care. All you'll ever want is to get out, and if you're not given that, odds are you'll lose it. But while they're famous for these traits, the prison system is not afraid to get their hands dirty. And when I say dirty, I mean all forms of extreme actions against humanity. In a video published by a news channel, the story of a 22-woman woman who suffered at the hands of the Iranian prison came to light. The reason for her arrest is still rather unclear to this day, but her experiences are as clear as the color of blood. Before she was even taken into the prison, her hair was shaved off, and not in a way that a barber would. At every chance, the guard inflicted unbearable pain on her, cutting deep into her scalp and doing everything to make her feel uncomfortable. After the shaving, she was blindfolded and dragged to a hidden room for interrogation. But this interrogation soon became the most brutal experience of her life. Her interrogator started touching her, insulting her, and even sexually abusing her. She begged for mercy, crying that she was a virgin. But all her pleas fell on deaf ears. And when he was done with her, what followed next was even more unbearable. Believable. After he raped me, he urinated on me, on my whole body. And that is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the brutality female inmates are subjected to in this Iranian prison. They can make death threats at you countless times. They can even put you in front of a firing squad with hundreds of guns pointed at you, all just to scare you. But at the same time, they can take away your soul with unthinkable torture. And age is not a barrier. Author Marina Namad is one of the 40,000 Iranians that was arrested during the mass arrest between 1980 and 1985. And at age 16, she was one of the very few who survived hell in Evan Prison. On the night of January 15, 1982, she was arrested. And for Marina, this was the beginning of hell on earth. I was at home about to take a shower. The doorbell rang. My mother called my name. It was like 10 o'clock at night. I opened the bathroom door and there were two really big guns pointed in my face. She was blindfolded, dragged through the halls like an animal, and then she was interrogated. During her interrogation, they asked for the whereabouts of a girl, a girl she knew nothing about, but maybe she should have made up a story because they seemed to be pissed about the truth. They asked me again, where is this girl? And I said, listen, I really don't know. They handcuffed me. And when they handcuffed me, I was 90 pounds back then. When they handcuffed me, they saw that my hands are going to slide out of the cuff. So they put my wrists together and they put the two wrists into one cuff. And as it clicked, my right wrist cracked. And the torture hadn't even started. After she was chained with a broken wrist, she was forced to lie on a wooden bed. They removed her shoes and then her socks and her bare feet were exposed. Then they lashed the soles of her feet with a cable. And when I say cable, I'm not talking about tiny strings of wire. Cables as thick as a water hose. And instead of a hollow, the cable was filled with deadly strings of full, heavy rubber. And as they lashed her feet, her brain dismantled and then came back together. You think you're going to die, but you don't. You just keep repeating the cycle of pain and agony the next one, much more painful than the last. And Marina was not the only victim of Evan Prison. She said she could recount hundreds of unspeakable arrests during her time. And many of these arrests turned into deaths. 6,219 were probably killed by a firing squad. 210 were hanged to death. 303 faced gruesome tortures that stopped their beating hearts. 14 people died from being burned. And 17 other people were dragged until their skin peeled off with only their carcass left stringing along the ropes. I could keep going. But the 
details of these heinous deaths are far too excruciating, and all of this is tied to the hidden torture chambers of the Iranian prison. But it's not just about the torture. Even the riots in this chamber are deadly. And if it's anything like the prison riot on the 15th of October 2022, there's little to no chance of every prisoner not getting involved. Heavily armed police officers barged into prison wards, and tear gas flew everywhere. There were countless explosions that resulted in a fire, and nothing short of chaos. In short, it was the definition of how bad life can get for female inmates in prison. It's a life that'll make you wish your reality was a bad dream you could wake up from. But while the prisons in Iran are known for utter chaos, the female prisons in the United States have a more complicated system for making the life of the female inmates unbearable. America's dreaded prison guards. The U.S. incarcerates more people than any other country does. And you could say American prisons are hell, but the female prisons are even worse. Just as the hidden chambers of Iran, the guards in American female prisons are more scary than the walls themselves. With over 85% of the women reporting some sort of physical or sexual assault, there truly is something going on. And it's not just speculation. The Department of Justice is investigating hundreds of deaths that have occurred in these prisons. And this is slightly because law enforcement officers may be involved. Don't believe me? Ask Cheryl Weimar. She was nearly beaten to death by four guards in prison, and while they didn't succeed in killing her, they broke her neck. She was beaten because she complained about not being able to clean the toilet. Apparently, she also complained of pain, which reportedly hindered her from being able to clean. But instead of providing a solution for any of her problems, the guards slammed her hard into the concrete floor, dragged her outside, and stomped on her until they broke her neck. Now, Weimer is paralyzed from the neck down, and now she's going to spend the rest of her life aided by a breathing tube. But just because they failed this time does not mean they don't succeed in other cases, because until now the case of Latandra Ellington is still unclear. She was only seven months away from being released, but on the first day of October 2014, she was found lifeless, alone, on the ground of the solitary prison they put her in earlier that day. Everyone believed it was natural causes because that was what the medical report said. And by natural causes, I'm talking about a heart disease. The medics reported that the reason Ellington died in prison was because of a certain heart disease. But here comes the shocker. Ellington never had heart problems. And that is not the only reason her family members believe her death is suspicious. Yes, Ellington died on the day she was taken to solitary confinement by a police officer. But that day was also 10 days after Ellington had sent a strange letter to her aunt. And it was just 24 hours after Ellington's aunt had reported the letter to the prison officials. So is this a coincidence? Ellington's family certainly didn't think so, especially when the letter revealed some nasty details about a certain Sergeant Q. He was going to beat me to death and mess me up like a dog, she wrote. He was all in my face. Sergeant Sergeant Q then he grabbed his radio and said he was going to bust me in the head with it. This letter made Ellington's family determined to conduct their own investigation. So they conducted their own private autopsy, and the results revealed some worrying details. Ellington didn't die of natural causes. There was no heart disease. It was a blunt force trauma that killed her. The internal bleeding caused by what she was hit with led to lethal levels of blood pressure medication in her system. And this hemorrhage resulted from heavy, deadly, repetitive punches to the guts. On top of that, Ellington had bruises on on her body with cuts to her face. You've got to ask yourself, what kind of heart disease could leave a woman's body covered in bruises and cuts? If that's not suspicious, I can't tell what is. So Ellington's family decided to go one step further. They hired a civil rights attorney to find out what really happened behind the walls of this deadly American prison. The first call was to request for a CCTV surveillance video to see who was with Ellington on the day she died, but the prison denied this request. So the investigators decided to utilize other means to get the information they needed. They spoke to some inmates and and some of them eventually, revealed that a police officer escorted Ellington to her cell. Since his name was not provided, I'll just call him Officer X for convenience. As it turns out, Officer X took Ellington to solitary confinement because of a distraught call her aunt had made to the prison about the letter. But that's not even where it gets twisted. Ellington had seen what she was not supposed to see. Sajik Q, the man allegedly responsible for Ellington's injuries, had reportedly assaulted another inmate sexually, and Ellington was a witness to this crime. Ellington then filed a complaint, and that's when all hell broke loose. Sergeant Q started to threaten her, scaring Ellington to the bones. After some time, Ellington confided in another police officer, Officer X to be exact, asking for a way out and for protection. Officer X then urged Ellington to report the case to a family member and ask for protection. Did you see how it all played out? Ellington saw the forbidden. She was threatened. She confided in a police officer who advised her to ask for protection. She was given protection, and on the same day, Ellington was taken care of. Another coincidence? Maybe or maybe not. But all of these became clearer after the other female inmates 
roommate started talking. And when I say talking, I mean hinting with secret unnamed notes. Because apparently, talking in the Lowell prison is a deadly mistake. A mistake that can earn you the kind of heart disease that killed Ellington. Hence, the reason why the prisoners had to use secret unnamed notes. The prisoners, in their notes, wrote that Ellington's cellmate was being threatened by the officers. Apparently, they said that if she spilled on what happened to Ellington, the same thing that happened to Will happened to her. But that's not the only proof. Even one of the inmates explicitly mentioned the unspoken rule of silence within the walls. I've seen lots of injustices, but no one cares. And as a means of survival, you learn to turn your head and stay silent in order to stay alive. These are the words of a decade-long inmate at Lowell. But why should inmates remain quiet? Or more importantly, what are the things that happen within the walls that should not be spoken of? Scary things happen at Lowell. The kind of treatment that no human should have to go through. Women are being assaulted in all the possible inhumane ways you can think of. From sexual violence to physical assaults, women are being beaten by guards as a sport. The kind of inhumanity you find in movies and chalk it off as a scriptwriter's imagination running wild. But sometimes reality can be stranger than fiction. And that this was not a movie or a game. It was real. Inmates were being tortured for fun as a sport. And it is so deadly that even the inmates suspect that many of the suicides at the prison were actually killings. Murders that were covered up. But it's more than the brutality of the acts. It's more about the system. Think of a mafia group or a secret criminal organization. However, this group is not on the FBI's wanted list. And the targets I'm talking about, those that are harmed or can be directly affected by the group, are female inmates like Ellington. That's what the secret unnamed notes reveal. The notes called the system inside the prison like a gang. They said the prison guards all split themselves into cliques with leaders and followers and, of course, rivals. And these guards were involved in a never-ending power struggle to control the prison. But the worst part was that the inmates were pawns, doomed to be caught up in the crossfires and to be used for rank increase or to prove dominance. And if you're about to ask, it's possible that even Ellington was a pawn. Because even inmates believe Sergeant Q was set up by Officer X. A prison where the guards run the place like a criminal gang is worse than hell on earth. But it's still not as notorious as the prison designed like a graveyard. Russia's Special Graveyards in Russia, there are some prisons that every prisoner tries to avoid. Because even the worst of the worst criminals, and I'm talking about the deadliest type of offenders you can think of, even try to avoid these prisons. Called the Corrective Colonies of Russia, they are better known by their Romanized acronyms IK. There are a number of IKs, and all of them are known for nothing but bad news. From IK2 to IK6 and even IK14, the inmates are mere sitting ducks waiting for when to be slaughtered or tortured. But there is a way out, and the only way out lies in the hands of your inhuman Humanity. The proof of this is in the story of 44-year-old Tatyana Gavrilova, who was arrested in 1999 for murder. And while the most common punishment for murder is a death sentence or life imprisonment, Gavrilova was not sentenced to death. At least it wasn't her life that was targeted. Gavrilova was sentenced to 16 years in IK prison, which is technically the same as a death sentence to the soul. Her 16-year sentence was like someone who was buried alive. And just when you are about to die, you are dug up, given treatments for revival, and buried all over again for a never-ending pain cycle. But how did it begin? Gavrilova killed her friend in self-defense during the event of normalized sexual abuse, and she was later arrested. And the moment she stepped into the court, that's when things changed for her. Indeed, she committed murder, but Gavrilova claims that the court also painted her as an alcoholic, a drug addict, and everything bad enough to make her fit for IK. And it worked. She was taken to the prison where, according to Gavrilova, there's only one law. Everyone does as they wish. Seeing just how deadly her situation had become, with prisoners free to beat up other prisoners, and guards free to to do as they want, Gavrilova began her quest to leave. She started writing letters of appeal contesting her sentence. But no matter how many appeals you decide to write, in the Russian prison you are pretty much wasting your time because they'll never get sent out. And that's exactly what happened to Gavrilova. Her appeals remained in the office like letters waiting to be mailed by a dead man. And that's when she caught the attention of the prison officials. But I'm sure you can already tell from the story of the American prison that it is nothing but bad news to be noticed by the guards. Unfortunately for Gavrilova, after she began became a figure on the guards' radar, the beating began. Gavrilova was subjected to severe merciless beatings at almost every time of the day, and when she's not being beaten, she would be locked up in solitary confinement for more torture of the brain and her sanity. Then it moved up to the confession spree. If you didn't take responsibility for a crime you didn't commit, it would only be the beginning of your troubles. The worst will be yet to come, she said, and it worsens when you try to report to another officer because they are all in the same league. Gavrilova was beaten for sport by prisoners and officials, and being put 
in solitary confinement became a daily routine for Gavrilova. But when another female prisoner was murdered in the same prison where she was, Gavrilova saw it as a chance, her way to get out of this dreaded IK prison. The female prisoner, who was called P, was murdered by fellow inmates who called themselves observers. They tasked themselves with the responsibility of maintaining order on behalf of the prison guards. But their way of maintaining order went from gang beat-ups to the torture of fellow inmates and from P's story, even to annihilation. And do you know what the guards do when the observers are at work? They stand around and do nothing. Because again, the only rule is, everyone does as they wish. So if you want to survive in this dreaded prison, it's best not to meddle in other people's affairs. But Gavrilova didn't want to survive the prison. She wanted to leave, so she offered to take the blame for P's death. Can you see how sickening this is? To escape the unbearable life she was living, Gavrilova had to confess to a crime she didn't commit. Gavrilova confessed that she was the one responsible for strangling P and dumping her corpse in the corner of her cell. She claimed responsibility for P's death because she believed this would give her a chance to tender her appeals to be transferred from the prison directly to the officer in charge. However, when the case reached the officer in charge, the story changed. He forced her to dictate her confession, and her appeal letters were neglected. Rather than her appeal letter being submitted, Gavrilova's reputation for notoriety kept growing, from murder under the influence of drugs to manslaughter for no reason. Gavrilova was transferred to a prison that was even more dangerous than the one she was already in. This time, Gavrilova was transferred to IK-28. The only news that comes out of this prison is the story about another dead inmate. No one gets out, and even if you do, it's when you're covered in white cloth and led away in a bed. Because IK-28 is a special graveyard where all sense of humanity is dead, from forceful demands to the confession of unbelievable crimes to starvation, routine beatings and more, Gavrilova was treated worse than an animal at IK-28, and she wasn't the only one. It wasn't a special treatment. Every inmate at IK-28 suffered such treatment, and when they saw that Gavrilova wasn't going to budge, they took her to the hospital. But not the kind that revives you, the kind that kills you on the inside. According to her, you lose yourself in there. Under the influence of these drugs, of the torture that they inflicted upon us, you soon forget even how to hold a spoon. A year later, they established that she was healthy, and this female inmate was moved to another IK prison called IK-2. Gavrilova continued sending her letters of appeal, making sure to write that she was not in a good condition due to the treatments she had been subjected to in the prisons, but she still wasn't getting any response. In IK-2, Gavrilova continued to suffer the same ordeal, because again, IK prisons are known for their harsh regimes and human rights violations. When they beat her, it would be two or more officers hitting her like wrestlers punching an airbag. However, Gavrilova would eventually find freedom at the end of this long, dark tunnel of inhumanity, because Russia's Human Rights Commissioner had finally gotten her appeal and was set to check things out. The hospital staff were shocked when I was brought in looking like a corpse, my head shaking. Gavrilova was hospitalized in a hospital ward for some time before she was eventually released. In American dreaded prisons, if you die, it might move the ranks of the guards, but in Russian special graveyards, your life, as well as the lives of all the other prisoners, it all means nothing. And when the officials have nothing to gain or lose, they can do as they please with your life in prison. That's how bad it gets. But when I say you are yet to see the worst of them all, I mean it. Deadly Prison Malays of Mexico our next prison is one that almost doesn't have a photo without corpses on the floor, or heavily armed police officials with big guns parading the entrance. The prison is located in Tijuana, Baja California, Mexico, near the Mexico-United States border. And if you were a neighbor, you'd send a lot of noise complaints, if you're still breathing, that is. This prison is not just the worst of all when it comes to the guards, but even the prisoners do not seem to like peace either. With over 6,000 inmates in a prison created for less than 2,000 human beings, it's clear to see why there is always violence in La Mesa. But it didn't always used to be like this. At least, this was the prison where the famous Mexican musician Chalino Sanchez spent time back in 1984. Sanchez was arrested on human smuggling charges. It was said that his musical journey began in the La Mesa, composing songs for other inmates. But now the only music you'd be hearing are gunshots and people dying in a fire. And this is no exaggeration. Because of the riots, over 60% of the prison has been destroyed and more than 20 inmates have died, including two U.S. prisoners serving time in Mexico. But how? How did the prison become so iconic for its arson and gunshot playlists? The answer lies in La Mesa's deadly melee, a riot like no other. This act is not targeted at one inmate or one guard. Here, everyone, including the 120 female inmates, the thousands of male inmates, the guards, and the other people who live in the prison, everyone is in danger. And the start of the riot is sometimes unbelievable. On the 13th of September, 2008, drugs and cell phones were found in the cell of a prisoner during a police search. The prisoner rebelled, and the police responded accordingly. In the end, the inmate died. Surely, it is legally wrong for a guard to intentionally shoot down a prisoner, and so the guards involved were being arrested or sought for. But before the arrest, the prisoner 
prisoners had already taken the law into their hands by starting a deadly riot. The riot, which lasted for 12 hours, claimed two additional lives and injured over 30 other people. When the California State Police came to the scene, it was said that one of the inmates was beaten gruesomely until death, and then the body was thrown into the fire they had started. But while this riot died down, the worst was yet to come, and the worst came only three days later. Just before 1 p.m., the female inmates of La Mesa rushed to the top of the prison and began shouting, and this is not just some form of tantrum. These women meant business. They scuffled to the top, breaking lights as they passed by and littering the ground with sharp pieces of bulb. And if you know anything about prison riots, it spreads like wildfire. The other cells caught on, and in no time, another prison riot had started. Who started this riot, you ask? Well, the real question would be, what started the riot? And the answer is hunger. News reports say that the prisoners had been complaining that since the last melee, they had not been treated well enough. No food, no water, and no proper medical treatment. And you know what they say, a hungry man is an angry man. Or, in this case, it makes a very angry woman. The inmates showed all levels of violence, throwing huge rocks at the prison guards in an attempt to inflict injury. It was like they had nothing else to lose, and it wasn't just the inmates. Families of prisoners had gathered around the penitentiary, refusing to leave. It was about to be an uncontrollable situation. And in a prison, as tough as La Mesa, the authorities know that an uncontrollable situation is not an option. So the police officers had to make a choice, and when they did, people died. The prison guards opened fire on the inmates in an attempt to regain control. Some people called it an unfair fight, guns against stones. Some others called it a massacre provoked by the state. But it was a riot that began with La Mesa's female inmates protesting and ended with an increasing death count. 17 people died, 13 of them were shot to death, and the other four died from injuries sustained in a melee. Then later, the death count increased to 19 inmates shot execution style. After a while, an update revealed that the toll climbed to 21, and then it ended with at least 23 inmates dead in the brutal female prison of Mexico. Who is at fault? I'd leave you to decide. But one thing remains constant. You can say it is safer to be in a prison where all you have to do is stay silent to survive. See, but don't speak about it. But what can you do about a prison where regardless of who you are, where you are, or what you do, you're bound to get caught up in a crossfire or a prison arson where nowhere is safe? That's La Mesa State Penitentiary, where heavily armed men surround the prison sites like armies guarding a nuclear bomb site. But you might need to take a breather here, because North Korea's prisons are more than you can ever think of. North Korea's labor camps. Before I dive deep into the female prisons of North Korea, I want you to know that some of the details might seem unbelievable. Also, to some of you, it might be considered graphic, and that's because the treatment that prisoners receive in any of North Korea's camps is not humane at all. But just as every other prison I have mentioned, let's start at the very beginning. North Korea, like every other country, has prisons, but here they are not called prisons. They are called re-education camps. And here the political prisoners, people who were imprisoned for just criticizing the government, are mixed with common criminals. This means that you could find a journalist sharing the same cell with a murderer, kidnapper, or any other hardened criminal. Each re-education camp has between 500 to 7,000 prisoners each, and there are around 25 re-education camps in North Korea. That makes a total of around 50,000 to 150,000 prisoners in these camps. But that's just on paper. Escapees have mentioned numbers like 7,000, 50,000, and even 200,000 prisoners. And these people are stuck together behind the walls decorated with high-voltage barbed wire. Wires. But what makes these camps so brutal? Aside from the barbed wire supposedly used for high voltage areas, that is. <laughs> North Korea's re-education camps are like the worst place any inmate could find themselves, and political prisoners are reportedly treated just like beasts. The guards of the prison basically tell the prisoners that they have ceased to become humans. You are not human beings. You must think that you are beasts, otherwise you will not survive. And survival is the only option you have in a camp like North Korea's. The brutality level of each camp varies. Camp 1 might not be as brutal as Camp 16, and Camp 14 might be the killer den, the place of no return. But it really did didn't matter what camp you were in. The treatments in all the camps were similar. And I'll start with the work the prisoners are forced to do every day, labor work. <laughs>
뛰어야 돼. This is a testimony of a former North Korean defector. She is one of the lucky ones who have escaped the horrors of the North Korean camps. Labor was the tool for re-education. The idea was that after intense hard labor, the prisoner would confess and then be set free. But most prisoners drop dead from the extremities of the tasks they are given. They are forced to work from as early as 4 or 5 a.m. till midnight. These prisoners have no break time, pee time, or rest time. And if they dared to complain, speak out, or even breathe when not allowed to, it's execution time. An ex-female inmate of Kechon Prison, soon O.K. Lee said, I saw one young housewife who had children aged five and seven. She was forced to come to the prison. She shouted that she had children. and that her children would starve at home. And I saw her executed in public, in front of 6,000 prisoners. There were six executioners with three bullets each. They would shoot a total of 18 shots to the heart. That is inhuman. I was so sad. They executed a mother of children, just like that. Kechon Prison, where soon O.K. Lee was incarcerated, was also known as Camp 14. Lee's story showed that it isn't just the extreme labor that is the problem in these camps. Hunger was also a huge problem in the North Korean camps. And for those who complain, death by firing squad might be the answer they get. Still, Lee isn't the only prisoner who has faced this ordeal. Another victim is Ms. Wang. Unfortunately, most of the female inmates end up being victims of a really painful and horrific death. And the only thing the prisoners can do to avoid this fate is to eat everything and anything, from live rats to snakes, bugs, and even grains from animal dug. These are the equivalent of broiled chicken roast. Because every other day it's work, agonizing threats, and pint-sized meals unfit for even a bird. And the pregnant inmates in these camps are not spared of these inhumane conditions. Either pregnant women are forced to abort their babies as soon as they land in prison, and mothers are immediately separated from their children, or even killed. And when I say abort their babies, it's not a surgical task. It's either the woman's womb is injected with salt water, or the woman is kicked repeatedly in the stomach, or the baby is killed immediately after being born. And guess the murder method, buried alive or stomping till death. But beyond all of this is the torture and the executions. And no, this is not like the American prison where the prisoner was reportedly murdered in secret. Nor is it like the Mexican prison riots, where the stories of how prisoners were killed remain unclear. Here it is a live show, a reality TV of people being shot, hanged, slaughtered, or beaten to death. These executions are carried out in front of other prisoners to deter them from trying to escape and to show them the fate that awaits them if they go against the rules. Execution was not just the ultimate punishment, it was the only punishment. For talking, it's death. For walking around where you are not supposed to, it's death. For picking seeds of beans in the midst of an animal dug, when caught, it's death. And death was mercy, because if you are not killed in the prison, you'd either get to watch others getting killed, or watch yourself get burned, or beaten, so that you'd beg for death. Survivor soon. Lee Kim mentioned one of the ways prisoners were gotten rid of. And brace yourself, it's not something anyone would wish on even their worst enemies. Sometimes prisoners were used as biochemical lab rats. Soon, Lee Kim stated, when Kim's second son was alive, he tried to manufacture biochemical weapons. They tested them not on animals but with human beings because our enemy is not an animal but a human being. Once they picked out 50 persons from our group and they put them in the auditorium and gave them a piece of boiled Korean cabbage. As soon as they ate it, blood came out from their mouth and anus and they died. I saw that in 20 or 30 minutes. They died like this in that place. And just in case you were wondering what would happen to the dead bodies, they become fertilizers for crop or they get burned. Unfortunately, this is the treatment female inmates are subjected to in some parts of the world. And we can only hope that sooner rather than later, there are reforms that make such practices a thing of the past. Thank you for watching. You can also click on the card on your screen and I'll be waiting on the other side with more content.